Hi everyone, this is Jonathan Corey. Uh, welcome back to the latest episode of the Precursor Perspective. Uh, Halloween theme for you uh, this week, given we are nearing that time of year. Uh, for those of you rejoining, welcome back. And for those of you joining for the first time, I'm lucky enough in these uh, conversations to talk to a lot of folks uh, that I keep saying are a lot smarter than I am, certainly with more experience than me as well. Um, and we've been exploring over the course of the last few seasons as we enter season three now, this being the first episode of season three, we've been exploring a number of issues centered uh, around the world of B2B SaaS. Uh, in season one, we were talking about the new remote reality for customer success and services teams and how companies were responding to some of the issues brought up, brought forward by the pandemic. And of course, in season two, um, we were really unpacking with various practitioners, heads of customer success, CCOs and heads of professional services, as well as CEOs, how companies were reimagining the world of professional services as a value enabler. Um, now in season three, which is as hotly waited for as the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as the latest season of succession, we're looking at the world of high velocity services, but also, and importantly, we're gonna be bringing some outside in thinking into the conversations. So there's no better place to start, ladies and gentlemen, than my guest today, which is the man, the myth, the metrics legend, Mr. Dave Kellogg. How are you, sir? I'm great, Jonathan. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. I, as I just told you before, I'm recovering from getting a, a knee to the face by my six-year-old, uh, which is always good. Um, but apart from that, I'm doing well. Whereabouts in the world are you today? I'm in Silicon Valley right now, uh, just, just right near Palo Alto. So kind of what used to be the heart of Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah. Because last time I talked to you, you were in hipsterville you were saying up a little bit north of the city right with a wonderful woodland backdrop i think yeah quite a bit of eight, eight hours north so as i was up in bend oregon yeah it, 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 it's certainly very hip i go i google mapped it afterwards i was very very curious i thought i thought it looked like an amazing place now for those of you that don't know um uh, and i certainly do, do know a little bit about your background perhaps you can share for our listeners a little bit about your background your career and some of the highlights because it is very interesting varied and successful as well sure so um that would be the, the the compressed version is um kind of self-taught programmer entered the industry in tech support jobs and consulting uh discovered the power of sales and marketing moved over to sales and marketing as a career uh have run marketing at three different startups um it, the, the biggest run was a business objects from 30 million in revenue to a billion in revenue over nine years, but have done two others. Um, have run as CEO two different companies, one from 80 million or from zero to 80 million, the other from eight to 50 million. Um, and currently have sat on, I think, between five and seven different boards uh, as an independent director. Uh, about three to four of those have exited, maybe four. Um, and currently work as an executive in residence at Balderton Capital, uh, based out of London and run my own consulting business and run my own blog, plug, Kelblog, K-E-L-L-B-L-O-G. <laughs> and for those who speak French, Kelblog means what a blog. So <laughs> that was Amazing. entirely accidental, but but nevertheless true. I love it. I love it. That was that was how I was introduced to you, sir. So the, uh, the blog on the inverted demand generation model um, is still used at Precursive, actually. Um, it's, uh, there was a phrase for quite a while as we were scaling, what would Dave do? Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, it's fantastic to have you on the show. A number of our previous guests are massive, uh, massive fanboys and lo love your work. So it's great to have you on. Y y you've had this amazing blend of experience, and I love the way that you talk about startups that are at $30 million. Uh, the, the difference in the American market and the UK market, there's quite a contrast. But I guess that blend of experience, um, you've seen several iterations in the world of SaaS. Um, and I think there's shifting mindsets in, in both the way that companies think about growth and the way they think in some instances about running businesses. Um, one of the areas where I know you've done a lot of writing is in and around professional services. And I think the world of services, is, we've, we've observed it change very, I would say very rapidly in recent years, as companies have really just thought about like, how can we really ensure that our customers can generate more value from our products and services more quickly than they have in the past? Um, so from your vantage point, like how have you seen in the companies that you've been involved in, professional services evolve in, in SaaS in recent times? Sure. 
Well, I think, I don't know if this one so much is an evolution as it is a point of continuing confusion, um, which, which I'd say is what's the, because I want to start at the top. What's the point of professional services in a software company, yeah. right? And, and I think there's two camps, maybe three, but, but one camp gets it completely wrong and just says it's you know, to maximize the size of the services business and to maximize services margin. And, and I hope we could quickly agree that that's really not, not the point. It never was the point. And in SaaS, it's definitely, definitely, definitely not the point, right? Because if you look at most SaaS businesses that we're talking about, if you want to know what they're worth, we'll take their subscription ARR, multiply by a number, that's the value of the company, right? Notice the complete omission of PS revenue, right? <laughs> it's not even in the math, right? So, yeah. so, uh, so I'd say the, the point, I mean, let me just start at the top. The, the point of professional services in a SaaS business is to maximize ARR. Um, and, and, I, and while I think in this day and age, most people know they should say that, they don't all act in accordance with it. Uh, and that's where it gets interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I would certainly be in the camp that would, would agree that it's not simply to maximize rev services, revenue and margin. I do think there's a lot of people that pay lip service to it, as you said, and then mm -hmm. the actions don't quite speak as loudly as the, as the words. Um, how do you think about the role that services should play in, in companies scaling then? Like you talk about maximizing ARR, right, as a, as a mission, yeah. but as a business is scaling, does that, is, is there some nuance to what services should be doing at different stages of that, of that scaling uh, journey? Yeah, so I think, <clears throat> I think a couple of things. Um, I mean, first, back, back to the prior point, there are times when people are paying lip service that the correct thing to do is sit them down and say, if you want to run a services business measured by the number of consultants and measured by gross margin, you should go do that, <laughs> right? Just not here. <laughs> Start a consulting company. Yeah. yeah. Start from zero every year. Start from zero every year. Yeah, It's a perfectly respectable way to make a living. I have no problem with it, right? It's just, it's just not here. Because sometimes you have people who go back and forth from independent consultancy to software vendors, those are the ones who get most confused, right? Because they've lived in the other world, maybe grew up in the other world, and then they come to the, our world, the software world, and, and they're not rethinking it. So um, I, I think that's the first thing, which is if you find yourself in that situation, just have a quote unquote come to Jesus talk where you just say, look, you're either gonna do it our way or I'd love to set you up as a partner. We need partners, right, to, to do consulting revenue, and we'd, we'd love to work with you. But, but there's no compromising on this point. The, the point of the business is to maximize ARR. Now, to answer your question, how do you do that? I think there's three ways, uh, and we can talk about how they vary as a function of scale, but let's first get the three ways down. One is they can help you win deals, right? I, I think professional services people are kind of a secret weapon in sales, right? Because they're perceived as, you know, perceived as more impartial and arguably should be more impartial uh, than, than the salespeople. Um, then second way, the, the primary way is to make successful customers, right? So, so, so how do we take somebody and make them successful? Um, and the third way is then to, to help people expand, right? Uh, uh, once again, because if you truly are, a, <clears throat> to use a terribly cliched phrase, trusted advisor, um, you will know about opportunities inside the account, you'll know about abilities to expand. So, so those are the three ways that professional services can help maximize ARR. Uh, we can talk about how they vary as a function of scale and as a function of business model. Um, but uh, but I'll, I think we'll get to that more as we go through. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's interesting because I think the, the, everywhere we sort of see companies and, and, and vendors who are in this space in the world of services and customer success talking about time to value being one of the key metrics right for for companies now and i know that you um you talk a lot about some of the very important metrics and, and the link between time to value for example and and net retention right net revenue retention um sure. and i i see i mean we work with a lot of software companies who have started in the world of on-premise and then they've developed a SaaS proposition or they've moved their offering to cloud. And now they're in this world where, like you said, they've got people in there that are confused because they're stuck between the new world and the old world, oftentimes former consultants working in software companies. Um, but now that you layer in number three, which is they're now in SaaS, 
right? And and so the expectations, I mean, we we were talking to a company, like the expectations is we need to get this customer live within 30 days now for the for the what they're selling. And in some of these businesses, the people working there are not they are not not used to not starting a project 30 days from closing a deal, right? So you've got this, you know, people who are very, very discombobulated. Um, what would you be doing with businesses of that ilk to sort of coach them around, like how to think about like even the mindset, for example, like where do you start with the mindset of the executives that are running these organizations? Is it the sure. organizational design? Where, where, where do you start to get the people into the right way of thinking? So I think, I mean, for me, because of the, of the metrics background, I'll start with the metrics and incentives because often yeah. we shoot ourselves in the foot with them. So, so, so I, I think to me, the very place I'd start is like kind of set the whole executive staff bonus program on ARR growth, right? Um, just say, hey, we're here to maximize ARR. That's what we collectively as a team do. Um, I would tell the PS people, I, I, I would not... Because part of the problem is as CEOs, we, we can blame, or a former CEO in my case, but we can blame the PS people for the wrong mentality and they can show us their comp plan. And if the comp plan says get to this revenue target in services revenue at this gross margin target, whose fault is it? Is it you know, whose fault is it again? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, doing what, I'm doing what you told me to do uh, through my comp plan. So I, I think I would make sure we could drive into comp or dive into comp later if you want. But, but the first thing to do in comp is not incent the wrong thing, kind of do no harm. You know, <laughs> like yeah. we, it's actually hard to get the right answer, but the wrong answer is easy and shockingly common. Right, that we tell somebody their role is to maximize ARR, and then we comp them on services gross margin. Right, so yeah. so, so so you know, grab the mirror if we want to see the problem. Um, yeah. Now, now, assuming we haven't done that, to change the mentality, I think I, I believe. Look, I'll, I'll tell you the bad mentality, um, and then we'll talk about the good one. But the bad mentality, I've seen this literally happen on sales calls where the PS person shows up and says. I don't know what the salespeople told you. They always lie. I'm here to tell you the truth, right? Uh, and, and that's in my mind is not a healthy working relationship, right? Between <laughs> services and sales, I, I think that the healthy relationship begins before the customer is signed, right? It begins bringing PS in before, right? Like I've worked with companies where it's literally still a 1990s esque chuck the deal over the transom. Sales and pre-sales will win the deal. You will never be allowed to talk to a services person because they might say something like I just said. So, right. so rather than that problem, we'll just erect a wall. And then, yep. you know, once the contract is signed, then we huck it over the fence. Um, that's a terrible model. That's a dated, bad, evil Very dated model. model. <laughs> the, yep. the right model is to bring them in early and, and say, we want to, first, we want to market you as part of this. Like when they buy yeah. from us, they're getting our great software, but they're getting you to get, you know, you and your all your experience to help this get set up, to help them be successful. Um, yes, we want you to tell them the truth. Uh, yes, you can be slightly more jaded than the salesperson, but don't ever, ever say stuff like, you know, the salespeople are lying to you or like, I'm here to tell the truth. So that, that that's not okay. Um, but, but your job is to help make these people successful. And by the way, this is the hardest part. As part of this, and I've, I've done this to various degrees of success, but if you tell us that you think there's a 0% chance that we can solve these people's problem, we will take you seriously. Because that's the other thing. We want to bring them on the team, but not listen to them. And when they say, hey, I've, I've installed this stuff 50 times, it's not going to work in this case. And we say, shut up and just deploy it. Nobody asks for your opinion, <laughs> right? That's yeah. also not part yeah. of a healthy relationship. So. Yeah. Um, I often, I, I, I had at one company, I ran a, a, a PS escalation. I have a, the, the, in, uh, in manufacturing, they call it a Kanban cord, a cord that runs yeah. down the middle of the factory. Anybody can pull it and stop the line. I tried to have that in our sales team. Again, to various success, it's not easy. But if any SE, if any consultant, if anybody said, this is not a deal we should be selling, because um, funny anecdote, when I joined uh, Host Analytics, we literally had deals that were implemented by partners because PS refused to implement them because they thought there was a 0% chance of success, right? Wow. <laughs> so this would be an example of the, the old broken way to do things. And that's why I put on it. It was like, hey, hey, if there's a 0% chance of success, maybe we shouldn't sell the deal. Yeah. 
Well, I love, I like the ins, the like the insight there on behaviors, which is don't expect something that you're not inspecting. So if you're not incentivizing people on the things that you want to drive, like ARR growth, you're not going to get that if if people are are incentivized the wrong way. Um, what there, there's someone with your blender background where you've got a level of sophisticated sales and marketing experience and you've worked in some very successful sales and marketing organizations. I think those old world vendors where it's like keep services away from it, they have very, very naive sales strategies, methodologies. Most customers, most sophisticated customers these days, the, the, the buying behavior is much more sophisticated and there's much more research and learning done on behalf of the customer in advance mm -hmm. of talking to a vendor. And one of the things that I hear companies looking at is the professional services section of the company that they're buying from. If you sell something that's complicated enough, right, that requires it. And if you go onto those sections of a website, when you see something that's got packages, services as a service, you know, a clear view of what your onboarding steps will look like, a clear view that success and services are working together, that gives you confidence as a buyer that you're going to be in safe hands. When you click on it and it's like, oh, here's a list of all of our partners, right? <laughs> and like nothing, then they're like, okay, well, that's a very different experience to this one over here, for example. I, I feel less in safe hands. Do you know what I mean about that naivety? Is that, yeah. that resonate at I all do, with you? I do. Yeah, I mean, if the services page is, is simply a stock photo of a business meeting uh, and uh, we hire good people, uh, it, it should not, in a sophisticated buyer, uh, inspire much confidence. On, on the packages thing, I'm actually, I think there's almost a bell curve, which is if there's, if there's no packages, I get a little nervous. And if yeah. it's all, oh, just, you know, small, medium or large, buy a medium and you'll be successful. Uh, yeah. I get nervous again too, particularly if it's complicated software, right? Yeah. Um, and I do tend to work on the more enterprise complicated end of things. So I need to be careful because yeah. I know the audience is the whole curve. But, but I think the main thing is be realistic. I mean, again, I've worked with companies where I show up and say, what's our services model? Like 30K quick start. Great. Does 30K quick start actually get anybody successfully up and running? No. Why do we have it again? Because we don't want to cannibalize ARR. Or we don't want to, we don't, we think the, the most they'll pay is, you know, the same amount as the ARR. As the, they're never customer centric reasons. They're all venture -centric, you know, vendor centric reasons. Um, yeah. So packages scare me on both sides. The complete absolute, what I like to see personally is a methodology. Um, I want to see yeah. how you approach the problem. I want to see you've industrialized your approach to the problem. I want to see, right? Because methodology ultimately takes risk out of the project, right? That's why PS organizations yeah. build methodologies. So if you have a way of solving this problem that is sophisticated, uh, I like it. If you if you want to take, you know, I've seen companies that see 300K with a software and a 30K quick start. I'm like, boy, it better be one heck of a software package because I don't know how much you can get going out of 30K. Um, yeah. and, and, and to me, the, those are just incongruous, right? Like I, I do, I guess I do try to gravitate to a ratio, which is yeah. probably wrong. But, but, but the, the real thing to do is just ask your PS people, uh, you know, you can see it come out in two ways. One, you just ask PS people, does the very quick start actually solve anyone's problem? If the answer is no, the question is why, why does it exist? Like, yeah. uh, is it just marketing? Um, and the other question is just, um, well, I could invert the question and just say, how much do you typically need to be successful? And then we have to define success, right? And I, and I always like saying, attaining your first business objective. So if it's a recruiting system, you've recruited your first candidate, right? If it's a marketing system, you've run your first campaign. It's not, I can log into the software, right? Or if it's a planning yeah. system, I've got my first budget, right? I've actually attained a business objective. So I always tend to say, what is the business objective the customer is hoping to attain? What's a reasonable first one? How much time and services does it take to get there? And then diff that against the price list to go, hmm, there, there, there's yeah. a gap here. Yeah. When we were talking last, you were you were you were talking me through this idea of market alternatives dilemma, the market alternatives yeah. dilemma. Can you tell tell our audience a little bit about kind of what do you mean by that in this in this yeah. context? So, so one of the big questions here is is should it be free, right? Or, or yeah. free in double quotes meaning included in the ARR price? And yeah. I think for a lot of people that's a religious issue. 
right? Yep. Like you'll just find people who will know nothing about the business of the segment and passionately argue, no, services is value. We pay these people, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year for the good ones. And, you know, we should never give their time free. And other yep. people will say, no, the modern SaaS economy, people expect the software to be easy to configure and up and running. And it's all yep. part of the onboarding experience. And the answer is there's, it all depends on what you're selling, right? I mean, if you're selling a big, complicated piece of enterprise software, I don't know, CRM or a data intelligence system, that's going to require services to be successful, kind of period. And if you're selling, I don't know, Gong, I think you can get onboarded by a CSM and get up and running and start recording calls and get some value, right, with, 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 without it. So, so to me, I can't answer the question without knowing what the app is. Um, and the market alternatives theory is just, would... Would somebody pay somebody else to be successful with this software? And if they would, that kind of establishes a market price point. And then you say, wait a minute, just pretend we didn't have PS and all we sold was the software and we didn't have, it was 100% partner onboarding. Could they charge for it? And what would they charge for it? And now we're starting to get a sense of its value. And because that's how a customer would look at it. Right. I mean, customers don't necessarily look at it as a fixed ratio of ARR services. I believe customers are more than capable of understanding to be. And by the way, my recommendation for, for SaaS sales is don't talk services until you establish an ARR price point. This is what this software is worth per year. Do you guys agree? Is that in range with what the other software costs per year? Awesome. By the way, now let's talk about services. Yeah. And, and other vendors may try and twist the conversation the other way. But but I always think that the, the honest way to have that conversation is to say there's a price of the software, there's a price of the services. And with yep. most enterprise SaaS vendors, you don't have to buy the second thing from me. In fact, I don't yep. necessarily want you buying it from me because I can't fully yep. staff our services market demand. I have 57 partners who I'd love for you to work with um, because... I'm not, you know, see prior conversation. I'm in the business of maximizing ARR. I can't do that if you're not successful. So these partners are quality organizations. We run a certification training program, right? But I don't know. I don't need your services dollars. In fact, they're a scarce resource. Which ultimately, to me, means you should be a premium provider, right? I think mm -hmm. another mistake people make is they're like, well, because we feel bad because this should have been free, religious viewpoint. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. It should have been free. Let's make it cheap. And that undercuts the partner ecosystem. Because now... Yeah. A partner, if you're charging, you know, I don't know, whatever, if you're charging hundred bucks an hour, how can a partner charge 200 bucks an hour? Because you're the vendor, right? Yeah. So, so in general, I think that the, the right answer is if, if there's a serious amount of work that needs to be done, charge for it and try to be a, try to set a hot, be the premium provider of services to enable a partner ecosystem because that's what you want to have happen. Yeah. The other question I wanted to make with the bigger point was, look, you talked about the old world services people and the old world salespeople. I think in the old world, you were selling mistake avoidance to IT, right? I mean, I hate to say it, but but every that model yes. works when you're selling IT. Basically, we're the market leader. It won't be a mistake to buy from us. You can make a lot of sins in sales and in services and get away with it because they're not actually buying success. They're buying lack yeah. of failure, right? Uh, oh, yeah. I bought Oracle. It wasn't a mistake. I'm okay. Um, yeah. And the beautiful thing about SaaS is people do buy success, right? They're, they're not buying the absence. Uh, this is when you sell to a business owner, not an IT person. No, no. I, like, I run marketing. I'm trying to buy better campaigns. Or I run customer success. I'm trying to buy, you know, buy either more satisfied customers or a higher net dollar retention, right? Like I'm not buying the absence of failure. Thank you very much. Um, and, and in that paradigm, it's super important to get people kind of, you know, mentally shifted to people are buying success. And by the way, this is why they'll pay for services. If, yeah. if it's needed to be successful, I'll pay for it. No, no, yeah. Yes, I want, if somebody else will give it to me cheaper, could I get it free, right? I, I, want, I don't want to overpay for it, but, but I'm trying to solve a problem here. Um, and that's yep. why I don't like the 30K packages because the, the only problem the 30K package solves typically is for the vendor, right? So a salesperson yep. gets to know nothing about onboarding. They get to understand nothing about your problem, what you're trying to do, but I can give you the miracle cure-all 30K kickstart and, and you know, you'll be great. And that, that's yep. why I get nervous about those. And, and, and so I think one of the, um, one of the things that we've seen over the last years is this, is this convergence between the worlds of professional services, right, and customer success. Like, as you mentioned, you were onboarded by 
a CSM, right? In your in your in your tie with Dong, um, and so I think those, those we see kind of those worlds converging. We see the fact that you've got sales teams and services teams and CS teams needing to or trying to work closer together. And the pandemic in particular shone a, a, a very bright light on the world of customer success and its importance as sales slowed down for some organizations, many organizations, not others. Um, and therefore the role of that book of business became ever more important. Um, you've been two times CEO, you, you know, you, why would these why are these air gaps between these departments? And you talked about the example at, at, at host, right? Where there was people saying one thing or one thing being done that shouldn't have been done. When you've got these air gaps between these functions, why is it so important to bridge them? Why is it so important to get these teams working more closely together and in, and in harmony as it were? Yeah, I think for a couple of reasons. I think the most basic one is my, my marketing DNA coming out. But, but because the, the other people are, <laughs> I hate to say it, but you, you can get away with those air gaps when all your competitors also have them. Um, so, so they're switching, you know, I would argue maybe five years ago, it was a competitive advantage not to have them. Now it's becoming table stakes to have eliminated them, right? Like people expect today that the services guy is not going to show up and contradict the salesperson who's not going to contradict the CSM, right? That, that would be shocking. I think today, I think, Five, seven years ago, it was disappointing, yep. but not shocking, right? Ten years before that, it was probably expected, right? So, so, so I think that the rising tide has said, no, customers, first, I think because customers are buying success, not the avoidance of failure, they want to be successful. They want to look at your organization. Who is the team of people I'm going to be talking to? Another thing I don't like is the handoff. I, personally, yep. I, I hate that. Um, or it's like, it's terrible so word, isn't it? Handing you off to your CSM, yeah, you will yeah, never yeah. see me again. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so that was all part of the air gap, right? Like yeah. you know, oh, um, you know, my job is to you know kill animals, and and these are the butchers who turn them into you know meat, who then turn them into lunch, or you know whatever it is, and it's yeah. just too siloed. The, so I think some of it is just the evolution of the industry. And the evolution of the buyer, which is like, no, no, I, I want to know the team of people I'll be working with. If I'm never supposed to call you again, that doesn't make me feel good. I don't like being handed off to the CSM, right? I don't mind calling the CSM for a certain set of issues and calling you for other issues, but 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 I expect there to be a team of people, the company who are interested in my success. So so I think that's why you want to get rid of the air gaps. I, I also think the nature of the software has changed such that as we talked about. Sometimes, sometimes you still need what I call grizzled, you know, grumpy curmudgeon consultant with 30 years of experience to tell you like you're doing it wrong. And it's really <laughs> not about yeah. deploying software, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. It's about your organization is screwed up or even messing these people sometimes do, right? They, they, they come in and really reset your business process. Um, and it's, and it's part, you know, that goes part and parcel with installing the software and deploying the software, but, but it's, it's really a much higher level value out of that. Sometimes you need those people, sometimes you don't. So I, I just think the evolution of software and the ability to get software that's kind of up and running so quickly, um, is saying that, no, sometimes you want to see us to onboard you. Sometimes you need the grizzled, grizzled veteran. Sometimes you need somebody in between. Um, and we need the business model to be flexible, right? And, and my main point is let, let's, in theory, you know, unless you're running a velocity services model where you're really just doing onboarding checklists, which again, yeah. scare me, there are cases yeah. where they're appropriate, but I've worked with companies where they're literally, they're doing stuff on the checklist to install a product that the customer didn't buy, you know, because yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. step 13 on the checklist and the customer's yeah. like, what are you doing? And it's like, I'm executing the checklist, right? So, so, so those things scare me because, because I'm, People buy for business value. What's the business objective you're trying to attain? And, and I'm yep. not going to do anything on the checklist that doesn't support that. Um, so I, I guess ultimately I'm arguing for enlightenment. But but I think the reason the air gaps have to go away is because buyers won't tolerate them. And uh, yeah, and basically if the buyer doesn't want them, who wants them? Well, then it just becomes you know internal company politics. And that's, that's not healthy, right? If your CS people are fighting with your salespeople, you probably need two new VPs, you know, not one. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's also, there's some like fundamental language issues, I think that exist, right? Like you talk about the word handover. 
Like that'll be on in a million companies. That'll be on some form. There'll be an internal form that's like says handover. It's on, process right? to hand off. Yeah, yeah. I've seen yeah, yeah. the onboarding process. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll probably be written on a customer journey, right? And you're like, yeah, yeah. what? What? How is that there? I mean, we try. I I endeavor to get everyone to use the word transition in our business. Like we're transitioning from here to here. Yep. Um, our our C, in our in our business, the CSM leads the the kickoff with the services team, but the CSM actually leads the kickoff. They they run it, yeah. so it's it's as one, so that it's not like, you know, they pop up like three months later and like hi, uh, sort of thing. Um, but it's 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 interesting because we've I've seen both small startup companies where typically those two teams can be one team to begin with and then become two teams, and then yeah. we had. Um, Matt Berg on this show from SAP Concur, and they've just merged their customer success professional services organization in that business. Yeah. And so he was talking about, you know, these two worlds colliding with very different metrics, very different expectations, very different behaviors. Yeah. Like you say, really different um, age groups, right? Yeah. If you look at the average tenure and age of a services organization versus a CS organization, it will be wildly different wildly Agreed. different so uh yeah i i, I think it, it's definitely not easy now um you, I got, we i got, got tricks though. So, I, got yeah, one, yeah. I got one i gotta get this go. one in um Kell kellogg tricks well we've got to, we're gonna we're <laughs> so gonna this is this will be patented I, and charged for right? <laughs> yeah, yeah this is a pro tip yeah no yeah. my favorite way to solve that problem so first organizational structure wise I mean, I increasingly like a model where PS and CS report to the chief customer officer. There's still yep. different organizations because they're different roles, but having yep. them with a common boss makes a lot of sense to me. Um, yep. My The trick is I love to define organizational roles, not by the org chart, but by how an individual practitioner, right? A leaf node in the org chart introduces themselves to the customer. Um, and in mm -hmm. general, I'll say the ones I like. I like when salespeople go, my name is Dave. I'm your salesperson. I am. I am going to ask you for money. I mean, I, I remember I, one of my favorite sales VPs always. They never put account executive on the business card. He put sales representative on the business card or the email footer. And his answer yeah. was, "I don't want them to be surprised when I ask them for money." Right. My yeah. job is in sales, <laughs> and I yeah, love yeah. that. So yeah. basically, my name is Dave, and I'm going to ask you for money at some point. Right. CS. My name is Dave, and I'm here to make you successful with our software. Right. Yep. And then PS is basically, I'm from PS. I'm here to make you successful with our software. And based upon my 20 years in the industry, I'm probably going to tell you at least three to five things you don't want to hear. <laughs> right. And, and that's kind of the, the <laughs> PS <laughs> in order yeah. to do so. Right. And that's the difference. Right. The PS is a little bit the curmudgeon um, who, who's been there, done that, older, to your point. I think, I'm guessing you're going to say they were older. Don't know. Uh, you yeah. They're different. Yeah, I was. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Um, I mean, not definitely, but uh, but 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 even potentially. If you don't like those answers. I still love that trick. Forget even if you hate my answers, use mm -hmm. the trick. Just say yep. when a salesperson introduces, how do each of those roles say my yep. job is to blank? Super yep. powerful. Yeah. No. No. Absolutely. And and so these different like CS these customer success operating models. You've got this more commercial lens, right, with the, the sales orientated motion. You've got a success-led lens, right? Value orientated and adoption and enablement. And then you've got this services CS function. I mean, you mentioned planning before. Um, we had Erin uh, Siemens, who is now the CCO of Anaplan, for example, on, on this show when she was at ADP. And a lot of, um, you know, there's a big blend between services and customer success in their organization, for example, that we, um, that, we that she and I talked about recently. Um, how do you kind of like, how do you reconcile all these worlds? Should businesses like lean towards having one operating model or another or a mix of them? Or do you naturally have a mix of them as you go into enterprise? And, you know, do, do you, where do you start with that? So look, I think the CS role in particular varies a lot. I think the PS role is relatively invariant. I think yeah. the primary sales role is relatively invariant. It, it varies on the edges. Basically, the interface mm -hmm. to CS is where it varies. Yeah. Um, 
But the CS roll is the one that's super variable. I think there's three different flavors. I, I may come up with more than three, but but there's the, well, I call it the best friend. Hi, I'm Dave. I'm here to help you. How you doing today, Jonathan? Everything good, right? It's just yeah. that, like, they're your best friend. They're not that technical. They're not that product oriented, but they're your best friend. You need something? Let me get it for you. Great. Yeah. Um, and yeah. this is kind of the best friend. There's the, the more selling oriented one which is, hi, Jonathan, my name's Dave. I'm here to get your renewal. That's what I do. And I know I'm not going to get it if you're not successful. So how's it going? What do you need? Oh, you got some cases that are unresolved? Awesome. You got this? Oh, the PS guys aren't delivering? I'll get them, right? That's the more sales-oriented feel to it. And maybe, hey, can you introduce me? You told me if I get you successful, you'd introduce me to that VP in the other division. Come on, I want that intro. <laughs> right? That, that's the selling yep. renewal oriented one. And then there's the product oriented one. And by the way, when I joined Post, this is what it was. And, and it was this conversation. This is why I like the conversation so much. Hi, I'm Dave. Did you get that report working that I built for you? Yep. Right? And yep. that's a different animal. Um, yeah, yeah. That's more services, almost support, more kind of support yeah. plusy. Um, and to me, there's no right or wrong answer, right? It's just, let's be honest with ourselves that people come in different flavors. There are a lot of people who want to have all three of those conversations, right? <laughs> I can't, found, you know. found, found, founders who've had to do the job, right? And had to do it all. They made yeah, the report, yeah. they then got the intro. <laughs> yeah. Other than the founder who's actually done that and wrote yeah, the yeah, product, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. there aren't a lot of people. There are people who love to be your best friend. There are people who, who like the renewal people are more kind of junior sales types. The, the, the other people are more services types. So um, I don't think there's a right answer. I think it depends. The biggest thing I see where it goes wrong is we're just not honest about it. And we don't, and this is again, why I'd go back to tell me what the, tell me when I introduce myself to the customer, what do I say? And then tell me what a typical conversation with a customer sounds like. And if you give me some fragments, I can tell you which model you're in. And then the question is, look, the question would then be, why have you given expansion quota to the best friend? Because best friends don't ask you for money, right? Or yep. why do you have people who wanted to be salespeople working in the best friend model? Because they yep. want to go ask for money, right? So, yep. so to me, it's, it's just about alignment. Um, if, if I had to guess, I mean, but, but I'll tell you my personal opinion from most companies I work with, I like a model where sales sells. I mean, sales is kind of like, it's a thing in my mind. Like you're kind of born with it. It's a yep. desire to go ask people for money, blah, blah, blah. I like a model where CS people in general are the, the, the type two. Hi, I'm yep. here to get you renewal. Yep. And I'm also here to look for opportunities because my job's about making you successful and I won't make money if you're not successful. I like that. Um, yep. And then you support them. By the way, if that's what your CS org is staffed with, then you're going to need to have some customer success architects in that org. Right, because when they say this is broken and PS won't call me back because it's not billable and it's not really a support yep. issue, you need to have some guys on the team who you can say, "I've got four people who can come in and let me just pull one of them and, and they can help you with their problem." Right. So to me, it's, a, it's an alignment and organizational design question. But but in general, the reason I like the model I was arguing for is the best friend. I, I, I think the best friend you can have it, but I'd rather have sellers instead of best friends. And then I'd rather have those product people. Did you get the report working? Yeah, let's have some of those. But yep. let's have, if the team is 30 CSMs, let's have four of those or five of those who are effectively pre-low-level pre-sales. Last reason I like it all is career pathing because it makes a great career path from SDR to CSM to inside yep. sales rep to outside sales rep. And also from maybe uh, ditto on the services side, right? You yep. can be a customer success architect and then go to services. Yeah, I, I, we see in a lot of our customers now enablement services, and that's a term that's being used for what you would describe as more of that consultancy uh, CS type type of approach. Uh, but I, I do think the more sophisticated businesses that we work with have figured this out and that it's not a one size fits all structure. Under, under CS, they've got enablement, they've got perhaps a more commercial lens to it. Um, one customer, for example, they don't they don't talk about sales with their CS people because their CS people are they, it's kind of a dirty world, but they dirty word. But they talk about customer acumen, commercial acumen, business acumen. So they're like they're, they're they're getting those people to realize the value that they're delivering, and they're taking the horse to water, so to speak. And then commercial folks are coming in, 
But what they found is that their conversion rates are much higher on cross-sell and upsell, but because they're sort of getting the most out of the, the mix that they have. Um, with, with regards to this organization then, this more modern organization that we're talking about, where you've got this blurring of lines, you are a massive proponent and very famous for uh, your, your expertise around SaaS metrics. If I wasn't to ask you about this, pretty much everyone I know would like be like, what the hell are you doing, Jonathan? So I'm, I'm curious, like top three metrics for that, that both CS and PS should care about. I'm assuming that number one's going to be ARR. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but but yeah. over to you, sir. What what? And and actually, if you've got three, if you've got five, I, I'd I'd love to hear you yeah. you share what what why. So I'll, I'll just rifle them off, and I'm not even sure if I'm answering at the VP or individual contributor level. Uh, but but I may want to do a second pass, split those. Yeah. Let's sure. do the more fun question, the high level question. So yeah. what should PS care about as an org? I, obviously, they should care about, I mean, in English, I always say, maximize ARR without losing money. So, so it means I care about ARR and ARR growth. Uh, yep. And it means I do care about services margin, but, yep. but I'm not trying to maximize it. I'm trying to get it to be, you know, so it's, a, it's more of a gate on a compensation plan, right? Yep. Uh, it's not an incentive. So, so as long as it's above zero, I don't care about it. If it's below zero, I start to care about it fairly quickly. If it's below 10 or 20, I start to really care about it. Um, but, but, but the idea is let's maximize AR without losing money. And, and that constraint's important because it will for, force us to make hard decisions. Like if, if we only have a limited amount of capacity, we can kind of use for free to support sales. It yep. should encourage us to talk to sales about where do you want to put us? I, I've got whatever it is, two, two person months, I can help you with this quarter on deals. Where do you want to put them? And rather than let that be random or random slash organic, we could be strategic by talking with sales. Yeah. So I think I would go with, uh, for PS, I would go with ARR, services margin, but subject to that proviso. Um, yeah. And then I would probably go... I would go with post implementation CSAT. Yeah. Meaning right after you're onboarded, whenever we all agree right. that is, we do a CSAT on the product and on the onboarding process, both. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, I won't, and I'm not sure, again, I'm not designing a comp plan, but that's what I want to know about, right? Your primary mission is to, to help us maximize ARR without losing money. So, so I need you to. Think about ARR, I need you to not lose money, and then I need you to make people happy on their onboarding. Um, yeah. and, and I'm not exactly sure how I'd measure that, but I know the questions I'd ask, which is like, are, how happy are you overall with the product right now? You do business with us. I'd ask about how happy you were with your implementation team and how that process went. And I would ask you, did it happen in a time frame that you thought was that you thought it would happen? And if it didn't, do you view that as your fault or our fault? Because plenty yeah. of times. It's on me. I got distracted. I had to delay the thing by three months. So yes, we were three months late, but it's on me, not you. That's PS. On CS, I would go with um, overall ARR growth. It depends mm -hmm. on the business model, but I would go with uh, net dollar retention. Yep. Right. I like. I first heard this model from NetSuite a long time ago, uh, and there is a question of how you make sales and CS work together. But, mm -hmm. but the CS person basically owns a cohort. Like every, every CSM is their own little cohort of customers. And my job yeah. is to get them growing at 10% or 20% or whatever it is. Uh, yeah. I may not do every single thing that makes that happen, but, but NDR would be part of it. I would look also at uh, NPS, um, so that promoter score. And then again, there it gets tricky because there's so many different personas, right? And, and I'm a big, yeah. it, it, there's, here are the things that are all uncoupled, you know, buyer, versus approver versus user, right? Yep. NPSs, I care mostly about the buyer NPS. And then I always like asking as a separate question, intent to renew. Because there are times yep. where if you ask me how happy I am, I'm not happy at all. You're a five, am I gonna renew? Yeah, I don't have a choice. Or, yeah, <laughs> right? Like we cannot equate renewal with happiness or, mm. or non-happiness with non-renewal, right? You, you have all four quadrants operating. So, so yep. I, I always wanna know both. Um, because the interesting yeah. cases to me are the, so you're miserable at renewing. I mean, first, I, 
mean, joke, that's how Oracle makes a living, right? <laughs> if, yeah. if miserable customers didn't renew, there'd be no Oracle. So, so how much are we executing kind of in the Oracle quadrant uh, versus how much are we executing in the, no, I'm happy I'm renewing versus the other one where I'm happy I'm not renewing because of uncontrollable churn, a phrase I don't like, but, but, but a concept I do, um, yeah. et cetera. Wonderful. So much value in today's conversation, I'm sure for so many um, who will be tuning into this. Um, I think one of the things that, so first and foremost, thank you ever so much for taking the time to join. I think one of the things that comes across in how you think about the world is the honesty, like the need for honesty in interactions with customers in terms of like that clarity, that introduction and that honesty, both with the client, but also internally with yourself about what you're what you're measuring and why right um uh so that that i've i found that super interesting um i always love hearing you just talk about the metrics that matter um the mps one is very interesting one of our customers tracks it during the onboarding so they ask the services team to track the sentiment during onboarding and they look at the relationship between that data point and churn not the not the they track the mps at the end as well but they actually look at it during the onboarding because they believe that there's a mental almost like an emotional connection between the experience when you're in it which you never forget and and the year one uh, and the year one churn um i also think that just that point around like incentivize the right behaviors if you want to drive certain ways of working and certain behaviors right don't contradict yourself and say hey we're all about maximizing value and these types of things when your comp plan as you said is like Here's my margin number, mister. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, it's been great having you on. So thank you. Happy Halloween. Yeah. Will you Will you be dressing up and going around the neighborhood trick-or-treating? Uh, no. Oh, actually, well, <laughs> truth be told, I'm going to be at a, in theory, I'm going to be at a, a Grateful Dead concert on Halloween where, where everyone will be dressed up. So uh, oh, amazing. <laughs> oh, you're going to see the dead. Are you a deadhead then? I am a deadhead, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Hollywood Bowl on uh, Halloween. They're doing a show. Amazing. All right. Well, wonderful. Have a great time. Thank you ever so much again, and uh, take care of yourself. Yeah, cheers. Thanks for having me on the show, Jonathan. All the best. Take care.